What's up, Ross Spike Tribe? This is Ross Spike 125 back for yet another great reaction. This is Operation Barbosa Part 2 The Invasion. Just did part one there literally like a minute ago. So just finished it a minute ago. Yeah, really looking forward to this. And I'll do a Nukes Top 5 probably because I haven't done Nukes Top 5 in a while. You know? I love the way he pretend to be a German officer last time and a German newscaster sorry in a uniform and stuff I thought it was pretty good you know he really delved into it that way which is pretty risky let me tell you people out there take offense by everything nowadays but yeah he did it he did it in a in a good way he didn't take it too seriously you know what I mean it wasn't like a serious thing you know that's why I liked it uh, he probably was, he's just making fun of them to be honest and let's face it, they deserve to be made fun of. Them more than most. I say I'm looking forward to this one, can't wait to get into it, so let's jump in. Welcome back to Veltkrieg News, reporting from the front. All three German army groups are moving ahead at a fairly comfortable pace, and by our accounts, the Red Army should be destroyed any time now. For more information, <laughs> we go live to Army Group North. There's no time to lose. We must find the colonies. You mean there's more of them? This was probably just a scout. Well, I'm sure it's an isolated incident. Uh, let's check in with Army Group South. They're everywhere! Well, <laughs> surely it'll all be in hand soon. Uh, for more, we go to our man on the ground, Heinrich, who is currently marching with the infantry to catch up and hopefully end the last of their resistance. Apparently he's in hospital from exhaustion. Well, keep your dial here on Velt Creek News, covering the war for as long as it takes. Hopefully not much longer. On June 22, 1941, the German army, along with its allies, invaded the Soviet Union in Operation Barbarossa. I'll be going over a few myths, along with covering the main reasons that the operation failed, but the first myth that I want to mention, as petty as it may be, is that Hitler did not invade the USSR in the winter. The invasion began in June as early as it could after the spring rains, but I still see these don't attack Russia in the winter memes everywhere. And it's just not true. What are you, retarded? You may have a point as far as continuing the invasion once the winter sets in, but the invasion did not take place in the winter. Even Hitler wasn't stupid enough to do that, so... Stop it! But apparently I'm stupid enough to think it was actually what happened. <laughs> I don't know much about World War II stuff, you know, it's not really something I've really delved into that much. Apart from, obviously, the videos I do here, I mean, I'm, I'm learning about it a lot. I learned about it in school, but I had no interest in it. It was more like medieval or, or Middle Ages sort of times I, I was more interested in. But uh, I sort of just, this just sort of went over my head for some reason. I don't know why. You know, because it's an interesting time, you know. Uh, it's because technology was, I'm more interested in times where they didn't have technology, you know. But technology was a lot lesser than what it is now. You know what I mean? They had like cars, then they had tanks, they had, you know, guns, they had, you know what I mean? It just doesn't interest me as much. I honestly thought it was right, I think I, think I thought it was before the winter he, he started, which would have been kind of stupid, I think. You know, it makes a lot more sense he, he did it in June. He started in June, but they thought it would only last three months. Yeah, they thought at least three months, or yeah, the most three months. So, yeah, that's interesting take place in the winter. Even Hitler wasn't stupid enough to do that, so... Stop it! Invading forces were split into three army groups, North, Center, and South. Their basic objectives being Leningrad, Moscow, and the Ukraine, respectively. Within these army groups, though, you basically have two separate armies. The Panzer Troops, who are mechanized and consist of about 30 divisions altogether, and the Infantry, who number about 110 divisions. The common narrative of the invasion is of the German army being this huge mechanized force, performing encirclements all around the Red Army, killing and capturing scores of men all the way until they were lightly halted in front of Moscow. Uh, everything's under control, situation normal. <laughs> and to a certain extent, this is true. Soviet casualties compared to German casualties, especially once you factor in the ones lost to the encirclements, are much higher. But as Stahill points out, you have to look at where these casualties are concentrated. 
The infantry during Barbarossa was only moving as fast as someone can walk, moving at literally the same pace Napoleon's army moved when they invaded Russia years prior, meaning that they're going to have trouble keeping up with the mechanized forces. And this is an issue that I don't see talked about much, but is vital to understanding later problems. Because this means that the panzer divisions are the ones meeting the enemy first and taking the brunt of what the Soviet defending forces are throwing at the German army. So although German casualties look pretty light compared to the Soviets, they aren't being equally distributed amongst the army. Can you help me out? Huh? Sorry, I got my own problems, guy. The panzer troops are being hit hard and are the ones taking the losses, meaning the strength of these vital troops is waning pretty fast, taking a lot of the hitting power out of the German army for these huge encirclements. This also leads to a problem of the tanks outrunning the infantry, causing dangerous gaps between the two forces that the encircled enemy may still be operating in. This got so bad that between the battles of Minsk and Smolensk, Army Group Center's War Diary mentions a halt period for the infantry to catch up as the distance between the two was getting too great, something that as you can probably imagine did not fit well with Blitzkrieg. Material was being lost at greater rates than the Germans were used to as well. The Panzer Groups were losing a lot of tanks not from battle, but simply from attrition. The dusty terrain of the Soviet Union proved to be a fairly poor place for the German tanks, created with Western Europe in mind, to operate. Huge amounts of dust caused by the moving tank columns oh. driving through the dirt roads of the Soviet Union would get sucked into the engines of the vehicles, causing a high attrition rate for the Panzer formations. For example, in August, Panzer Groups 2 and 3 claimed Panzer. losses of 50% Ooh. of their tanks, most of which were perfectly capable and still usable vehicles, they just needed new engines, because the terrain and dust had locked them up. Guderian on multiple occasions went to the commander of Army Group Center asking for more engines because the tanks were there, they just couldn't run. But this was an unforeseen issue as the Germans always fought short campaigns in the past and planned for this one to be the same as I mentioned in part one. Yeah, so they're already in trouble, yeah? With the tanks and stuff, but yeah, this is it's crazy. They didn't, they didn't foresee the, well, how could they really? Let's face it, but the brand new have looked into it, or at least tried to, right? Apparently not. Why bother doing research when you can just send people in and find out, right? But this was an unforeseen issue, as the Germans always fought short campaigns in the past and planned for this one to be the same, as I mentioned in part one. So spare engines were never created in the numbers that were needed because the campaign typically was over before these problems arose. But if the engines were available, this may not have been a fix to the problem because also, as I mentioned in part one, the supply problems that were predicted very quickly became reality. As the Germans move into the Soviet Union, they naturally move further and further away from their supply dumps at the jumping off point meaning that the further they went, the longer it took for supplies to be brought up, and the things that were bringing supplies, namely trucks, were consuming more supplies themselves to get there. And this process yeah. got more and more difficult as the campaign went on. Supply groups were also being hindered by the large gap between the tanks and the infantry mentioned earlier, and that when going through these areas, there were oftentimes Soviet forces that would remain active that would be able to attack the trucks, along with many of them also being lost to attrition in the same way the tanks were, from the very rough and dusty terrain of the Soviet Union. By August, Army Group Center reportedly lost about 25% of their trucks, and Army Group North had lost 39%. The other way supplies were brought up was by train. This, however, had a lot of complications to it. Firstly, Soviet trains were bigger. The Soviet Union was a larger country, so larger trains were needed to cover the distances compared to those in Western Europe, and this meant that the gauge of the rail line was greater and German trains could not run on them. The Germans did have a couple of solutions to this that included units moving along the rail lines that would shorten the gauges for the trains as they went along. But because German trains couldn't run for as long, it meant that they would need to create more service stations along the route to keep them running. Running. In essence, wow. a large-scale building project had to accompany this invasion if the trains were going to be used in the ways that they wanted to. This was often easier said than done, though, as the Soviets enacted a scorched-earth policy as they retreated, destroying oh. railways, train stations, and locomotives alike to keep them falling into German hands. And although there were units instructed to move along the rail lines to prevent this from happening as much as they could, some units disobeyed these orders and a lot of the infrastructure fell victim to retreating Soviets to where the trucks had to remain the primary method of moving moving supplies throughout the campaign. And this issue really comes to a head during Operation Typhoon that we'll get to later in the series. You have to admit, that's pretty smart, you know. You see it throughout history, scorched earth, you know, they're burning crops, burning this, burning that, burning houses, burning sort of buildings, like, like special buildings and things. They try and stop, or not stop, but, but hinder 
the the oncoming force you know so you th you see that mentioned throughout all throughout history you know uh this isn't a new thing you know it's something they've we've done we've done for centuries but yeah it's the only smart thing to do really you know when, when you're trying to slow the the enemy down and this issue really comes to a head during Operation Typhoon that we'll get to later in the series. The overall result of these supply problems ends up being exactly what the German logistics officers had predicted. A start-stop pattern over and over again for German units as they move forward. Run out of supplies, then wait for more to be brought up so they can continue again. All the way into the rainy season in the late fall. Even through all these odds though, the Germans were able to win a number of huge victories in the opening months of the campaign. First taking Minsk, and then Smolensk, and besieging Leningrad, utterly devastating the first Soviet defensive echelon. Many hundreds of thousands of troops are taken prisoner, and for the moment to the Germans, and the world, it looks like the Soviet Union might fall, with some German newspapers in early October proclaiming victory in the East. However, German intelligence has completely failed at their analysis of the Red Army, how many troops, and how much material they could truly muster. By the Germans' count, they should have destroyed the Red Army by this point, by their rather accurate assessment of it consisting of about 5.5 million men. What they had failed to realize, though, was the Soviet Union's capacity to call up and muster the trained reservists it had, and the German commanders are completely vexed by this. They're coming <laughs> to get you, Barbara. Stop it! <laughs> After the initial invasion in June 22nd, the Red Army was able to raise an additional 5.3 million men by the end of July. And later on, although I'm getting ahead of myself, by December, the Red Army would number about 8 million men on the Eastern Front, in spite of their heavy losses, according to author David Glantz. Although the Germans have been fairly successful by the looks of things so far, by October, in the beginnings of Operation Typhoon and the approach to Moscow, the cracks are really beginning to show. They're already a month past when the campaign was supposed to be decided in September. Soviet armies continue appearing in front of them, even though by their count they should have destroyed it almost a few times over by now. Divisions are quickly becoming understrength, supplies are having more and more trouble getting to where they need to be, and yet the objective is still the same. Capitulate the Soviet Union, and forces are being driven ahead time and time again, without proper replacements and with exhaustion growing. The successes have been great, but there seems to be a growing dissonance between the commanders making the calls and the troops on the ground. And despite the obvious problems that are surfacing, the grand strategy, or really lack of it, has not changed. Although some objectives are being tweaked as time goes on. And as the rainy season sets in, Army Group Center sets itself up for what they hope to be the last push that will land them in Red Square. That is the end of the video. Yeah. I think I enjoyed that one too. I've got the other two parts ready to go. I will do them at some point. But I thought I'd give you two parts, you know, just to start it off. And yeah. Very good. Very, very good. Now, there's not much I can say. I mean, I said it in the last one. Oh, you know. I like the way he does it all. I love the colored footage. Restored footage, should I say. And if you like TV and movies and anime, you might want to check out my second channel, Royal Spartan Take 2. Uh, I do reactions to TV, movies, and anime on that channel. And there's like 22 or something videos up there right now. So yeah, if you want to go check that out, and if you like it, subscribe. That would be great. It would really help me out. And uh, if you want to request stuff, go right ahead. If you want to request... Uh, more history ones on this channel. Uh, try to try to do like like early eighteen hundreds back. You know, I'm more interested in that kind of stuff. So just use your best judgment. You know. Okay. Until next time, I am out of here.